when did you get this idea of going to Casals? I mean, was he someone who you had heard in public? Oh, absolutely, yes. I mean, he was always, I mean, incredibly lucky I was, because he was absolutely the only cellist I really wanted to study with, in the sense that he, he was the benchmark for all cello playing. I heard his Dvorak concerto on record, yeah. which was a famous record, and it was the most beautiful thing that I'd ever heard, and I still feel a bit the same way about yes. it. Yes. So you got a grant from the French government yes. to go to Prague yes. to study with them. Yes. Can you recall what it felt like to walk into his music room and be in his presence? Well, it was so um, clear, that vision of what walking into the room with him standing there. He had a little box, cigar box with tobacco in it, and he was filling his pipe. And my first impression was, my God, he's so small. Yes. This little man filling his pipe. I believe when he stood next to his cello, the cello was more or less the same height. Yeah, that's right. He was, I was amazed at how small he was. But what, what did he emanate? What emanated from him? Strength? Authority? Friendliness? Modesty. Yes. Uh, I, the, the thing I was looking for was there. Yeah. Uh, sort of... Godlike figure is completely the wrong way of putting it, but the sort of, the sort of per person I wanted to be like myself. Yeah. Mm. I'm told that he lit his pipe so often that sometimes, you know, a burnt out match would sort of fall down and glide down the cello and disappear into the, into the air hole. Yes. yes, that's right. Yeah. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. He smoked all the time when he was teaching. Him. And when you started having regular lessons, were you aware of some sort of a method or an underlying structure to this teaching, or was it fairly free? It, it, it was sort of both. I remember in the first lesson, I played him something that I thought I had played as well as I could at the time, you know. And when I stopped, he said, mm, very good. But it is your duty to play in tune. Yes. And then he said, I want you for, for a, this week just to learn to find the first finger and the fourth finger. Yeah. And to play a, an octave with the G to the G on the D string. Yeah. With the fourth finger and then reach back to the first finger and be reliably on E. Yeah. And to be able to put an E down reliably, it's amazingly difficult, and a B on the A string. Yeah. Um, and people take it for granted, but very often they play those notes sharp. Uh, he had an absolute insistent on the center of the note. Yes. And, um, and there, were, there were tendencies in the way the arms and fingers work, which people have. There's a tendency to play that E on the D string sharp, for instance, and to, to be uh, flexible. The flexibility in the left hand was something he was very insistent on, so that you have the middle fingers, the second and the third finger, yeah. are independent, and they, they belong together. So if you're playing a, an F sharp mm. in G major on the you na naturally flex your hand with the second finger behind the third like that. Yeah. So that you have a very, very natural hold of the hand. And then to play an F, you, all you do is you still have that gap between the fourth and the first finger, and then you pull back and play it. Did he have exercises that he had composed himself? Well, he, um, he just s said it must always be beautiful, always beautiful, always beautiful. Never play without sort of vibrato in a sort of stiff way. Always play naturally and always make something sound beautiful, aesthetic. So even if you're playing G, E, open D, E, G, you know, yeah. you're playing it in a sort of aesthetic way. Yeah. And then the excitement of playing a whole tone between the 
E and the F sharp to, to a very close yes. semitone. You like the leading note? The leading note, note sharp. So this is what they used to call expressive intonation. Yes, and that side of things was very, very uppermost in his teaching for the first weeks. Yeah. To absolutely make sure, he said, upper gray is not right, nearly right, it's never. No. You must always play really in tune. He, did, he used to say intonation is a you know, good intonation is a matter of honor. Yes, yes, it's your duty to play in tune. Yeah. I've often been struck by the sound he made, which was very, yes. very unusual. Yes. It's immediately recognizable, and it wasn't really beautiful in the ordinary sense of the word. But it had an immense, immense uh, sort of expressive power. Yes. And it, the sparing use of vibrato. Yes. Do you know what he was aiming for? Yeah, I, I think there's simple word is spirituality, really. There was a spirituality there, yeah. which struck me before I even met him. I said, this is, this is what I think music is all about. Yeah. And it, it, was spirit, it is not, listen to me playing the cello, it's listen to how beautiful this particular phrase is. And I think when he talked about a matter of honor to play in tune, he meant it was a matter of honor, really, to explore every phrase until you really re realize what was within it. But do you think there was any instruments that he heard as a boy in Spain that might have influenced this sort of directness and penetration? Yes. He, he was very... Um, he would uh, find it hard to find the right words. But he was much influenced by the sort of street musicians of the, the Catalan uh, what was it called? Cobbler Orchestra? Uh, they're, they're playing the, um, some sardana sort of, um, with an oboe. oboe sound. Yeah, yeah. That oboe very, sound very has hard. a very harsh nasal sound. But it's right in, you know... It's, it's absolutely a Very honest sound. Yes. And all his interpretations have something of that peasant quality in them, in a strange sort of way, I've always found that quite uh, intriguing, that such a very, very great interpreter of music was so rooted in something so natural and, uh, what, what, what do you say, just simply his belonging as a human yeah, being in some way. The humanity of yeah, it is yeah. so apparent in everything he did. But did he talk about vibrato? Did he talk about the need to make a personalized sound, you know, so that he would sound different from everybody else? He was... In his lessons, he would play along a great deal. Yeah. Which, in a way, was, was, was strange. But the more I experienced it, the more I understood how... what he was trying to do. Yeah. And the idea to be able to control the vibrato was that the, to be able to control the way the left hand voiced the actual pitch of the note. Yeah. It's not just selecting a pitch like on a piano, bang, you've got the pitch. You put that finger down, then there's a sensuality in that finger that continues. Mm. Whether it's doing vibrato or whether it's doing the, quite the opposite of non-vibrato, it comes from the heart, you yeah. know. You know the slow movement of the Boccherini concerto, the B-flat Boccherini yeah. concerto, yes. which starts on a G, yes. which goes on for a couple of bars, and you it have develops. To hold it for a long time. You have to hold it yeah. for a long time, and it can. That note has a whole world within it. Yes. And if you can start that in a beautiful, perfectly pitched non vibrato, yeah. But it's not stiff, and the vibrato grows out of it. Yeah. And having said that. He did talk about every note having a beginning, a middle, and yeah. an end, however yeah. long, however short. Yeah. And if you don't look after a particular ingredient of the note, you're, mm -hmm. you're not going to realize the musical importance of that note. No. So the beginning is vital, and people are inclined to start notes the same, with, yeah, an, yeah, yeah. with, a, with an attack, you know, always. Yeah. That. But he could do 
every sort of beginning you could possibly imagine. But he, his sound was not enormous, but it was penetrating. Yes, yes. So, um, I don't think he was interested in, in, in being... I don't think he was interested in being great. I think he was just interested in the integrity true. of what he was doing. Yeah. I believe he sometimes played the trick in rehearsals with an orchestra or playing much quieter than he would do normally in order to get the orchestra. I believe so, yes. And then he would play out in the evening. Yes. I mean, he had faith, he, he, he could, he could, he taught me things about the articulation in the left hand, which, which is so synchronized with what the right hand is doing, what the bow is doing, yeah. that it somehow makes a note live with, with more center to it than it would do if you weren't really concentrating on the, on the way the left hand is actually in contact with the string. Yeah. Now, he was known to put lean on certain notes. One yes. does not expect you to yeah, right. lean on it. Yes. So he must have been very interested in accents, not accents, but the weight of a note. Yes. And the, the, the rhythm. He must have been very concerned with people observing what was written. You know, not too much sort of um, rubato. His rubato was strange, and I think that uh, um, it was uh, it was dangerous is not quite the right word, but it was you had to be careful to try and understand what lay behind his want of a better word mannerisms yeah uh, he could one could hear in his playing sometimes almost excessive rubato, but if you put a metronome to it, you would find that. He's he would always make up for it. He was always, up with, yeah. always the rhythm is always there. The rhythm yeah. was always there. That rhythm was very much allied to his his Spanish Catalan yeah. background, sort of fierce, fierce yes. um, integrity, fierce integrity. But that that um, came through in his dealings with people. Is he yeah. a sort of moral? Um, Absolutely. Benchmark. Yes. Because if people fail, they were out. Yes, right. But do you think that um, fierceness did help to make him the great musician he, he became? Yes. That is to say that when he appeared on stage, people realized that he, he was someone who was deeply serious and was not afraid of being serious. Yes. When he appeared on stage, there was something um, there was a sort of magic attached to it because he was a small man, with a little man with a bald head and no hair, you know, a very unassuming looking person, but that yeah. was in it, to his advantage yeah, yeah. because he could walk on and create this atmosphere of almost a vacuum to be filled with something very beautiful. Yeah. And he would never throw himself around, he would be completely self-effacing physically yeah. while he was playing. But what was happening in the playing was enormous emotional energy being focused yes. in a very modest way. It was yeah. it was magic. It still haunts me. Yes. Well this sounds all you know wonderful and I envy you having well, I was lucky. Presence, I was lucky. Because I got to know a book called Conversation with Casals when yes, I was exactly. about 18 or 19. Yes. There were photographs of him at home practicing and playing in the church, you know, on his own. And it seemed that it was a very concentrated, simple and, and true life. That he was yes. very much against display. Yeah, or, or, or complications, you know. That Absolutely. You always said I'm a simple you man always and say, I don't yes. like complications. Yes. Yes, and that's that what I become, loved that's what yeah. I loved about him. I knew exactly what was going on. So the surroundings were always, always modest too. Yes, his surroundings are very modest. A little tiny little house he lived in in a little room there. Yeah. The top of this house in Prad. And his Catalan friends would come along and he would sort of mutter away with his pipe and 
And he had, had sort of open house, but there was a, it was quite political in a way. Yeah. But I felt incredibly in sympathy with yeah. him. Before I even went to him, I knew what had happened to him during the war, and I yeah. was so being, you know, an emigre myself. He was, he, he was um, as an exile. He was yes. self, and he was an exile in part during the war, and the Germans were also after him. Yes. And they, first of all, they tried to inveigle him to play for Hitler. Yes. <laughs> and of course, he absolutely dug his heels in. Yeah. And, and they were trying to be friendly to him and, and trying to trip him up. And he was in danger all the time. Yeah. And he was only a few miles away from the Spanish border. Yeah. And, uh, and, and Franco threatened to cut his arm off if he came, came back to Spain and that sort of thing. I mean, yeah. it was... It was it was awful, and but before before the Spanish Civil War, he was he was a great patriot from the Catalan mm. point of view, and the working people he had an orchestra for the working people of Barcelona and that sort of thing, yeah. and I admired his humanity simply. Yes, I know that he used to start every day by playing a prelude and fugue on the piano. Yes, which he referred to as a blessing on the house. Yes. Did you ever hear him play the piano? Mm, uh, no, I didn't actually. No. And I don't not, I don't remember hearing him play the piano. But he must have been quite fluent if he could play all the back preludes and fugues. Definitely. Oh, he definitely was. I mean, I'm, sadly I can't play the piano and I feel deeply sad about it. But I do try and start every day with Bach in the same way. Bach has this, this Grounding influence, doesn't it? It makes you well. It's feel it's like as if the integrates. Yeah, you know, it's like integrating into into laws of nature somehow. Yeah, you know, sapping something from the best. Yeah, just the best of humanity and. But Casals was very conservative. When it came to modern music, yes. contemporary music, yes. he never played it. No, he didn't, didn't even play a Debussy sonata. But did he ever discuss composers like Schoenberg? He didn't with me, but I read about his views. Yeah. I think. But he did, he sort of, um, he couldn't bear the sort of um, um, creaking gate type of music. It just no. was anathema to him, as yeah. it is to me, actually. Yeah. You know, he just couldn't bear it. And it does seem a lot of Emperor's New Clothes stuff going on, so you've got to be very careful well, in where you put time, yourself. He could have commissioned Ravel, Debussy, yeah. uh, Messiaen, even. But that's uh, obvious. Yes. Yeah, yeah. He could have commissioned so many fantastic composers. Part of for example. Yeah. Can you imagine if he had a chance? What a shame! By him? What a shame! So I'm a little bit puzzled by this reluctance to um, embrace what was new, and um, maybe he didn't hear good performances of this music. Well. I also think that it had to something to do with his background. Yeah. His father was an organist in a little church in Dundrell in northern Sp in Catalonia, and they were a working class family. And he was exposed to very basic music in his early life. Yeah. So he, it would have. And, and he developed very quickly as a, as a musician. Yeah. So that development took place within a certain limited sphere. And he did it more as on his own because I don't recall him having a famous teacher. No. But he had a lot of support from... Yes, he from, had support uh, from the aristocracy. Yeah, they, they yes. supported him. Uh, yes, he doesn't, doesn't, he didn't have a great teacher of any sort, but uh, he was very much, went his own direction, and I think whoever would have been his teacher, I think he would have always gone in his own direction. Yes. And uh, I don't think there's any aspect of his playing that I don't like. There are certain things I, uh, I wouldn't do, simply because I, I think they... They are old-fashioned in a way, some of the slides and things like that. Yeah. And he's, he used to grunt quite a lot. That was difficult for him, yes. Yes, and, um, and hit 
And now, just before he played it, can yes, you show yes. you've got it? Yes, yes, yeah. so yes. So, what do you think his legacy is now? Do you think young, pe young cellists are aware of what he did for the cello and that they're playing reflects his... his yeah. um, less than I wish. Yeah. I think the influence of the Russian school has been very strong. Yeah. And it's gone in a certain direction that I feel quite sad about because they, his understanding of legato yeah. was way ahead of what, what uh, the, the Rostropovich lot do. Yeah. His understanding of what the bow can do across several bows, they don't do. They play one bow and develop the middle of it and bugger the ends, you know. Yeah. So, uh, sadly, I think his influence isn't as strong as I wish it was, but, but there are people who are still searching around for it, and yeah. I'm, I'm fighting hard to, to get a decent legato in people's playing. But looking back, just for the final question, um, looking back on your experience, has it given you great support in life, to have experienced this with him. Do you think of it as a nourishment? Oh, I can't emphasize too much how much it's meant to me. No. It's been so reassuring. Yeah. And it always comes back to the integrity and simplicity of trying to be honest. Yeah. And uh, I think about him every day. Wonderful. <laughs> I think we should maybe leave it at that.